time grid we know as August 8th to 9th has always been a magnet for events of savage purification. On August 9th, 1945, an atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, thus bringing the Second World War to its apocalyptic finale. The first National Congress of the Ku Klux Klan was also held on August 8th. August 8th, 1907 is the birthday of Edward Gein, the notorious Wisconsin ghoul whose cannibal exploits inspired the film Psycho. On August 8, 1914, Hitler's friend, Unity Mitford, the British fascist who worked for an alliance between Germany and England, was born. On August 8, 1985, the Los Angeles Police Department first announced to a terrified public that the Night Stalker, a satanic serial killer, was haunting that city. On August 8, 1974, Richard Milhouse Nixon became the first president in United States history to resign. On August 8, 1969, Disneyland in Anaheim, California, opened the doors of its popular attraction, the Haunted Mansion. Later that same evening, August 8, 1969, at another mansion in Bel Air, California, Five persons were slain, including the film actress, Sharon Tate. The next evening, August 9, 1969, the murders continued when a grocer, Lino LaBianca, and his wife were slain at their home on 3301 Waverly, formerly the residence of Walt Disney. These murders brought the 60s to an end. In that year of fear, 1969, a myth was born that continues to fascinate the world. A man named Charles Manson and other members of his family were arrested in Death Valley and brought to trial for these murders. After the 20-year barrage of books, TV movies, magazines, lies, distortions, one may well wonder, is there anything left to know? Charles Manson has been transmogrified by the electronic thaumaturgy of the mass media into a larger-than-life, erratic emblem of evil. Manson has become the favored brand name for murder and madness, the very archetype of everything the popular mind understands as antisocial, crazy, and criminal. He is one of the last true heretics of our time. Is it possible to peer behind the monumental edifice of this Manson myth, that fiction forever frozen in time by the famous Life magazine cover of December 19, 1969? Throughout the world, this image has become an icon, as well known as the logo of Coca-Cola or McDonald's, and indeed Manson has become the property of the corporation a consumer product designed to satisfy an audience that loves nothing more than to be frightened, to regard its own death. It has been said that every society receives the criminal it deserves. Why and how has America conjured Manson to be public enemy number one, to serve the need for a villain, a scapegoat, a devil, in a world that claims not to believe in devils? This tape is designed to deprogram the minds of those who are still thinking, those who have not yet been lulled into sedation by the soothing lies that surround us. Yeah, <laughs> 
I was even born into the universe. In the perfection of that, I was born 11 11 34, Veterans Day. And my grandfather, my granddaddy, was, uh, was the uh, uh, conductor on the B&O Railroad out of Kentucky, out of the Blue Moon of Kentucky. That's off the First World War. Manson was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, the bastard son of a teenage girl named Kathleen Maddox whose ancestry goes back to the earliest settlers of Kentucky in 1792. Said Manson's much maligned mother in a 1971 interview. Charles was born out of wedlock, but it wasn't just any man. I wasn't a prostitute. I've never been a prostitute. I was just 15 years old and a dumb kid. I was Miss Dumb. But my mother was a very strict woman very religious and didn't allow smoking or drinking or even movies. So when me and my sister got a few years on us, I guess we had a tendency to be a little wild, the way kids will. She brought her child to Kentucky to be passed back and forth between various relatives, one of whom was an Uncle Jess, a moonshiner who struggled against the federal revenues. I'm from Kentucky. In Kentucky, I live in a county called uh, Moorhead. And they got them long guns. And if they don't know you, and you come up to holler, you know, we only got enough to last us to get through the winter. We keep ours in jars, you dig what I'm saying? We raise ours in hogs and cows. <coughs> Ain't got no money. Don't need no money. But I can get through this winter. You dig what I'm saying? Kick back. And each summer I get up and I worry about getting through the next winter. You dig? That, yeah, that winter was lost 40 years ago. And I'm the child of Uncle Jess that sent me rolling out of them hills in Kentucky. You dig what I'm saying? To save his cabin. To save his earth. To save his planet. Because he stood there and blew himself up when fucking assholes like this come in and want to take his steel away and shit. He blew himself up, he blew his kids up, he blew, his, he blew everything up, hound dog up, chickens up, he blew the whole thing up. But when he blew that up, he went into the same eternal dream, you dig what I'm saying? The same eternal dream that I've been in, 
in jail. You can't fake on me. You dig? Because I was your children. You can't fake on me. I was your children of the 40s. Eleanor Roosevelt can't fake on me. Yeah, that's what raised me. I'm a child of, I'm a child of my time. You know, you're a child of your time. My, I'm locked in the Second World War. All your brothers run in Vietnam War. Well, those are, your brothers are like my little kids. I was brotherhood to the Korean War. And my father was, was the Second World War. I'll put it to you this way. When I was a little kid in the streets, I was smoking grass. And it wasn't but a few people smoking grass. I come to jail as a beatnik. I don't know whether you remember beatniks. But what your hippies were of the 60s were what we were of the 50s. It's like a long time ago, back in the 50s, when I was in reform school. And I would get in a fight or I'd get in an argument and I'd be down in solitary confinement. And it had me down solitary confinement. I'd just go and I turned everything off a long time ago. Back in Virginia when I was when I was about seventeen. You don't mind if I don't sit down, do you? No. This is the only chance I get to, to come around unhandcuffed. For over 40 years, Manson has survived most of his life in what he calls the hallways of the always, the reform schools, jails, and prisons that have been his home and his tomb. His thought was born in the darkness of the whole of solitary confinement, apart from time, beyond the pale of society. In his cell, he created his own world and speaks his own language, where he has discovered that there is only the mind. Uh, right wherever I am, because I don't really move. If I'm here, I'm here. If I move over here, I'm still here. If I move over there, I'm still there. And in other words, wherever I go, I'm still there. I call it Pais. Pais, I'm from Pais. I'm a lichen. We're lichens. you want to explain the lichen? Well, I like you. You know, you look all right to me, man. You dig what I'm saying? So I accept you as a lichen. So when I accept you as a lichen, you're like kin to me. Because I never had a family, see? So you're like my kin. You're like kin to me. You know, and I accept you completely and totally into that. All the way through your mother's relationships and your father's relationships. All the little relationships that you guys have. I didn't have that because I was over here in reform school, boy school. I had the relationship of the guys over here in boys school, over on the basketball court. The basketball court is my kingdom. Always has been. Because I rule it from solitary confinement. So you think that's your destiny, not to? No, it ain't destiny, it's just me staying alive. It's my life. In other words, we all do what we have to do to survive, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you put a child down here, now I've survived this long, you know? I'm 40, I'm over 40 years in prison, I've survived. And I've survived you. Manson claims that the so-called straight world outside of prison is but an inverted reflection of the underworld in which he has lived. To him, the reality that presidents and law-abiding citizens accept begins in the hermetic, alternate universe of criminals, cons, and outlaws. But Elvis Presley was only the shadow that was playing up over somebody that was dying in a hole down in Brushy Mountain, Tennessee. Or someone that was over in the solitary confinement in, uh, in uh, you see what I'm saying? In other words, the real Humphrey Bogart and the real James Cagney are actors. I mean, the ones you know. The real ones, they died in here. You know, in other words, we die so that you guys can play actors. In other words, we got to be the bad guys so you guys can be the good guys, you dig? But in reality, we know that you're not the good guys, that you guys are worse than we are. You dig what I'm saying? Which is acceptable because we're outlaws. I'm, I'm a reflection of, you take a little baby and you put him in the penitentiary and you raise him up. I'm Richard Milhouse Nixon. I'm Richard Milhouse Nixon. You dig what I'm saying? But I'm him down here under the ground, man. I've had to do all the fighting while he gets up there and takes all the bows, dig? I got to carry the motherfucker while this fat sack, sack of shit won't let me call my old lady while his old lady tells him, shut up! 
I, made, I started all over. We started a rebirth movement. We started the rebirth movement that Carter stole. See, you guys outside don't realize everything we do in here, they'll play off and tell you that that's them. If I dig a foundation for a house, somebody else will stand on it and say, uh, yes, uh, I've, uh, this is my foundation here, and I've, uh, you know, in other words, in the United States, when you're running the United States, you ain't running nothing but con, nothing but bullshit, and nothing but devil. You're running in nothing but demon. The United States of America is the demon of the world. Manson seems locked in a perpetual love-hate struggle with his keepers, cursing them and forgiving them in the same breath. And I stand back and give other people their space. You see what I'm saying? But if they don't give me respect, I'm sending all that back around. I'm sending it all back around. You see what I'm saying? Because I live in my mind. Do you think your mind has power in the world? Oh, I would imagine, yes. Even though you're here. Yes. Yeah, the last, the last wave of these guys, the last wave of these guys that sent me to Vacaville are all gone now. Dr. Morgan blew his brains out. Can't, uh, we can't get into any music no, because we're, we're in, what I'm locked into is a soulless little to... jealous punk. Probably all kinds of ways we could do it. You could beat on the table. Yeah, I know. I was thinking, uh, let me use that trash can down there, uh, unless you want to pass a rule against that. Everything I do, they make a rule against it, see? If I wanted a bucket of shit, they'd tell me no, you can't have... Uh, they, and they'd, they'd pass a rule, send no buckets of shit, man. No matter what I want to do, they want to keep me from doing it. No matter what I want, they don't like it. They, you know, in other words, if I... I got it. I'm very capable and I'm unhandcuffed. <laughs> It's all together a different game. And these people that cut my mail off, let me tell you what they do to me. They cut my mail off. You can give this to the next wave of little kids that you grow up to. They cut my mail off. They lie. They cheat. They got some big old fat women that, that paint their faces and shit and dye their hair. And they cut the legs off the table so little girls can't get over and play with the little guys. And they got all kinds of little sex paranoias and little, little deceiving, little lying, cheating little things that they play. And then they'll push him off on somebody else and say it's all their fault, that they're no good and we got the bad guys locked up over here and we're all the good guys. You dig what I'm saying? When in reality, man, you got a bunch of scurvy fucking PC motherfucking pieces of shit. You dig what I'm saying? But that's on one hand. Here's where Abaraxas comes in. If they didn't have the love to do it, who in the fuck would? Manson invokes the ancient god of the Gnostic pantheon, Abaraxas or a braxis, a symbol of the eternal now, a state of mind that exists beyond the false dichotomies of light and darkness, good and evil, right and wrong. Manson justifies his forgiveness of his captors in the name of a braxis, a god that represents total reality. I respect that same fucking asshole that I'm down on every day. That's Abaraxis, man. We roll on it, we've been rolling on it ever since he come on the tier. He comes on the chair and says, fuck you, you son of a bitch. Throw shit and piss in his face. You dig what I'm saying? Knock him down. And he comes back and feeds me with it. And lets me live. And when he lets me live, then I look back at him and I say, well, you know, you're not so bad after all if you let me live. So then I have to let you live. So as long as I'm in here, I've got to let him live. Because he's only living in my life. Clang, bang, clang. Went the big iron door. They put me in a cell with a concrete floor. Nine other men in that cell with me, moaning their fate with destiny. Clang. survive so well in this situation because i'm very i'm very adapt i can adapt to just about anything man you know in other words i stay right here all the time i've been here right here all the time all my life so it's no new thing to me so when you go out in the prison yard you got to be up on everything that happens around you 
You can't let anything get in me. That, you know, I'm letting you get into me now. You know that, don't you? The spirit is there. And we could bring the spirit back to life, but for people like this, you dig what I'm saying? He hates white people. He's scared to death of this black guy. He's afraid this black guy's going to beat him up. The black guy ain't even thinking about it. The only reason he's scared of the black guy is because he's messed over the black guy so bad. You dig what I'm saying? He's got all that back. So what do you do is feed me back to this dude. You dig what I'm saying? And say, well, here, don't, don't hit me, but jump on him. And then they'll hold me in the point and stand me out here in front of all these black people, you dig? And then push me down in there and try to get me hurt and try to get me killed in every way they can. And then when they can't, then they say, oh, wow, man. Then they want to wear boots and wonder about, I'm going to catch up with you. I bet you I catch up with you. I bet you I catch up with you, buddy. I bet you I'll make you be what you are. Or I'll skin your fucking ass. I'll hang you on trees. I'll do every fucking thing I can do to do just what, exactly what I got to do to survive, man. I've been in jail since 1943. I've been locked up all my life. I've been locked up all my life. So I'm in that dream. I am not that dream. Don't get me. I am not that dream. I'm only a witness. One little witness. One little fucking little piece of shit in that dream. There's all kinds of people in that dream that are already all down the road, you know. According to 1961 prison records, he killed the time he was serving for various charges of pimping, forging checks, and petty theft by studying various systems of personal development, ranging from Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People to L. Ron Hubbard's Scientology. On the vernal equinox of 1967, March 21st, at 8.15 a.m., the 32-year-old prisoner, number B33920, was released from Terminal Island Prison, requesting permission to travel to San Francisco. I am a mechanical man. A mechanical man. And I do the best I can because I have my family. When Manson arrived in San Francisco in 1967, he drifted into the anti-culture that the media was already calling hippie. He began to attract a following, mostly of young women who were drawn to his music and his philosophy. There's a bunch of broads that follow me around, but there's always broads following me around. Then when I got back out, the hippie was a takeoff on the beatnik, as the beatnik was a takeoff on the bohemian, or the bohemian was a takeoff on the boobskaboop. In other words, just loop de loops and circles that come in and out of these places. The idea of Manson as the ultimate hippie and the family as an example of hippiedom's ultimate folly has been ingrained into the public mind with all the other simplifications that have so far served as truth. In fact, as Manson has pointed out, he was a child of the 30s, not the 60s, and the family ideology had very little to do with the ideas of passivity and racial and sexual equality characteristic of the 60s. When black militancy and civil rights were at their height, Manson insisted that his family retain their cultural and genetic heritage. When the feminists were burning their first bras, Manson taught his family to look to nature for an understanding of the balance between male and female, initiating them into the joys of complete submission. Feminism? Oh, I'm a matriarch. I'm a beautiful woman. I'm a very beautiful woman. All my women know that. <laughs> All my women know that. Do you have any good memories about the people who were your wife? Oh, all of them. Sure. They're all beautiful. Lynette Squeaky Fromm, one of the first to join Manson, once wrote, Born into this imbalanced world of women's law in 1967, carrying truth over the threshold, he met thousands of young in the streets. I was one of them. He stood our words up in truth. He never broke our wills. 
we put up our lives and the symbol of one finger as alternative to anarchy. In the family hierarchy, each woman is a member of the Order of the Rainbow, each with a corresponding color. Lynette Fromm's color in the rainbow is red. Fromm, who was imprisoned in 1975 for the attempted assassination of President Gerald Ford, remains loyal to Manson and his cause. She better be right on. She knows what she's got to do, see? She knows what she's got to do to survive on this planet Earth, just like <coughs> all the people that are with me do. The ones that are with me do. The ones that are not with me are not with themselves. Uh, it's squeaky, the one that's down there doing life trying to get me out of jail. When Fromm escaped from prison for two days on Christmas Eve of 1987, a wave of paranoia swept across the nation that had not been seen since 1969. That one woman could inspire such fear is a sign of how powerful the Manson myth has become. In contrast to Fromm's loyalty, Charles Tex Watson, the principal murder in the Tate LaBianca case, explains his family days with the convenient excuse of diabolical possession. Now Tex atones for his sins as a model born-again Christian prisoner in San Luis Obispo Prison, where he serves as a prison chaplain, delivering sermons to the unsaved. In 1979, Watson was married in prison to another born-again Christian who has since given birth to his children, the fruit of what one imagines to be wholesome Christian procreation during conjugal visits to the prison. Manson regards Watson's new persona with bemusement. Tex, Tex is beautiful. Tex got off with his, you know, Tex got up his gifts in. He was trying to walk around and say, chicky chip him, foo, you know, and he was there for a while. And we were learning new things and we were experiencing our bodies and stuff. He did, but then he decided that he wanted to go back into what his mother was doing. And I looked over at him and I said, well, if you, can, if you can get anything new over in there, you dig what I'm saying? Go ahead and see what you can find out, but I'll tell you everything on this finger that's over there. You know, save you a long trip. But he wants to go back through Jesus Loves Me. You dig what I'm saying? He wants to go back and worship and play all the games that we played for 2,000 years. And if that's what he wants to do, it's okay with me. I, you know, I'm still right there saying, all right, man. You know, like... Uh, if that's what you want to do, but you're only destroying yourselves, man. Always is always forever. It's one, it's one, it's one. Inside yourself for your father. Always love, always love, always one. I'm just so far from behind you. The illusion has been just a dream. The valley of death and I'll find you. Now is when on a sunshine day. Bring on the young perfection, for there must surely be no cold, pain, fear, no hunger. You can't see, you can't see, you can't see. The ghosts of the family still haunt the locales where they once lived. In 1968, Manson persuaded the octogenarian George Spahn to allow the family to live on the ramshackle movie set, The Spawn Ranch, in Chatsworth, California. It had appeared in countless old cowboy films as the archetypal western town. Here the family engaged in an ongoing psychodrama, changing their names and personalities, immersed in their own dimension of make-believe, with Manson serving as director. They lived inside the facades of the crumbling sets, tending the horses on the ranch and living off of food thrown away in supermarket garbage bins. Now, 20 years later, only a field of overgrown weeds stands on the site. The Spawn Ranch was burned down in a fire that destroyed every last trace. Here in this creek bed at the side of the hills leading into the Santa Susana Mountains, the family would gather in these shaded coves to listen to Charlie's music and practice their marksmanship.
Devil's Canyon, directly across from the Spawn Ranch, inspired one of Manson's songs. The pass where the devil you can see. Santa Susanna is the pass where you look for me. I live on, I live on my planet, my world, my desert, my thought. And it took me 22 years to get through these fucking hallways. This is what I'm mad about, to land my thought down on that desert. On Halloween of 1968, Manson decided to move his tribe away from the nearby urban decay of Los Angeles and into the wilderness of the desert, where he imagined they would find the complete freedom they sought. That Halloween night, Manson and a few others camped at the tiny Newman cabin, a refuge for miners and prospectors on the outskirts of the Death Valley National Monument. Manson's name is still carved in the wood of one of the Newman cabin doors, along with the year he first came to this desert. After the family made their way through the almost impenetrable Golar Wash, they set up a fire here in the hearth of the Myers Ranch and surveyed the austere beauty of the desert around them. family girls knew of an abandoned stone house down the road, owned by an old woman named Barker. Manson, after locating Mrs. Barker in nearby Furnace Creek, convinced her that she should allow the family to live in her place in exchange for general upkeep and a gold record given to him by one of the Beach Boys. Today, the ranch is much as the family first found it, as remote an outpost as can be imagined, hidden in the vast silence of the desert. Little has changed in the kitchen where the family prepared its meals. bedroom that once was Manson's. Now, what comes to me, I have to deal with, don't I? So I go out in the desert, and I'm sitting in the desert, and I'm not bothering anybody, and I'm just having a good day. I'd rather be a coyote in the desert but I've got to play act this goddamn human thing, this form that I'm in. solitude of the desert, he dreamed of training his family for survival, long before America had seen an explosion of survivalists moving into rural areas to stockpile arms and wait for the apocalypse. Inspired by the exploits of Field Marshal Rommel, the Desert Fox, in the 40s, Manson began a massive project of stealing and converting cars into dune buggy attack vehicles. They would be a new Africa Corps that would rule this desert domain far from the sick city. The motorcycle clubs that Manson had brought into the family, the straight Satans, Satan slaves, the jokers from hell, would serve as auxiliary troops. You dig? But if you want to get up and ride, we'll ride, and I'll be right there with you. You know who I ride with. I ride in Venice, California with straight Satan. Near the Barker Ranch, the remains of hundreds of stolen cars still lay rusting in the desert sun. One can still make out the fading psychedelic paint jobs. My world's out there in that junkyard. You know my world's in that picture. You know what picture's my world's in. 
This auto graveyard is one of the few signs that the family left behind. Its atmosphere is that of the remains of a lost civilization, an archaeologist's excavation, so distant does the alien world that blossomed here in 1969 seem. Oh, garbage dump, oh, garbage dump, why are you called a garbage dump? Oh, garbage dump, oh, garbage dump, why are you called a garbage dump? The family foraged into the nearby naval bombing range where they stole a communication wire which was strung around the Barker Ranch, further adding to the impression of a command post. The camouflaged lookout bunkers where the family girls would take shifts keeping watch of the ranch, knives strapped to their legs, are still evident. The fabled family bus that once stood in the front yard of the ranch crumbled slowly for years. Eventually, local prospectors dragged the infamous relic to an abandoned mine and dynamited it. As if symbolically destroying the spirit the bus once stood for. As Manson's plans for extending his increasingly militaristic commune to the further reaches of Death Valley expanded, getaway routes were planned. Emergency supplies of ammunition and gasoline were hidden all across the landscape. This still full can of gasoline stands hidden under the same rock that Manson left it under decades ago. Manson, familiar with local Shoshone and Hopi Indian legends of a subterranean lake beneath the desert, made sporadic attempts to search for what has come to be known as the Devil's Hole or the Bottomless Pit. Squeaky Fromm designed this prototype Armageddon jacket as the uniform for the Devil's Witches. This cavity in the striped butte near Barker Ranch is still said by desert miners to sport geysers of water and may be the source of the idea, long a part of local folklore in Death Valley, that posits the existence of an underground body of water. Eventually it was here, in the quest for the bottomless pit, that the family was destined to make its last stand. On August 8th, Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, and two other family women drove across this road from the Spawn Ranch to a house on 10050 Chielo Drive in Bel Air, where Sharon Tate, J. Sebring, Wojtek Frakowski, and Abigail Folger were murdered. The subsequent murders unleashed a tidal wave of panic and terror. Speculation in Los Angeles and the world as to the identity of the murderers ran rampant. Similar murders the next evening added a further frisson of fear. Actually, I wouldn't be here had it not been for those people you call the family. They're the ones that put me here. They're the ones that butchered up a bunch of people and said, here, we want you to see this guy. I didn't want to be seen, you know. I was trying to get out in the desert. They said, well, this is our star. You dig what I'm saying? Uh, I would have went ahead and let you believe in Elvis Presley. You dig? You could have had Elvis Presley for your little dreams. You dig what I'm saying? I didn't break the law. I got some friends that killed some people. But my friends have always been killing people. I've got a lot of friends that are very terrible people to other people. But to me... And they're just all, you know, you got to be responsible for your actions. I'm not your leader. I'm not your follower. Like the Kennedy assassination, the impact of the so-called Manson murders can never be fully understood. They entered immediately into the folklore of our time, an impenetrable cipher. It would be impossible to penetrate the fog of disinformation that covers these murders. The thick veil of rumors and theories conspiracies and cover-ups that obscure the way. 
Were they the first casualties of a holy war? Tex Watson's revenge for a drug burn by Wojciech Frakowski? Susan Atkins' attempt at a copycat murder designed to free Bobby Beausoleil? Were the murderers strangers to the slain? There are only questions. The murders seem to echo the sordid epitaphs of old Hollywood in their excess. Jay Sebring, the hairstylist to the stars, had been living in the house where 30s actress Jean Harlow's husband, Paul Byrne, had killed himself decades ago. Ironically, this article in the Los Angeles Times wondered idly who the unknown assailants were, while an article right next to it answered the question. On August 16, 1969, sheriff's deputies raided the Spahn Ranch and arrested most of the family suspected of auto theft. They were released shortly thereafter for lack of evidence without the police ever suspecting that they had had in their custody most of those involved in the murders. Of all the masks that Manson has been given to wear, it must be said once and for all that the most blatantly false is that of Manson the mass murderer. That Manson was not present at any of the murders, that his name is inextricably connected with, is a simple fact of history. Indeed, it has never been shown in a court of law that Manson has ever killed anyone. And yet he is known as a killer, a butcher, a murderer of unborn babies. There have been far grislier murders than these, and yet every media hack feels compelled to refer to them as the murders of the century, if not of all time. Had the victims been five anonymous individuals, who would have noticed or cared? Somehow the murder of a movie star is deemed the worst taboo that can be transgressed in our culture. Perhaps it is only America's drooling morbid curiosity for the death styles of the rich and the vapid, a soap opera to be lived vicariously with hypocritical tongue clucking and a copious flow of tears to mitigate their ghoulish guilt at being titillated by death. To even speculate on the motives behind the murders is a moot point, but it is generally assumed that they began with the similar murder of Gary Hinman, a music teacher and drug dealer committed by family member Bobby Beausoleil in July of 1969. A partial motive for the Tate murders may have been to give the impression that Beausoleil could not have been the murderer. Manson ruefully recalls the day that Beausoleil told him of his desire to kill Gary Hinman due to a drug deal gone wrong. I knew when I'd done something when I didn't do something. And someone comes to me and they say, I got a problem. I said, what is it? And they said, will you help me? I said, sure, I'll help you. He said, well, can I be your brother? I said, sure, I'm your brother. I'll help you do anything. What is the problem? He said, guy owes me some money. I said, well, if you're big enough, go get it. If you ain't, sit down and keep your mouth shut. He said, what would you do? I said, fuck it, man. It's only money. I wouldn't put my life up for no fucking money. You dig what I'm saying? He said, well, I'm going to go get my money. I said, well, that's up to you. It's got nothing to do with me. The guy went over and fucked the guy up, took his money. You dig what I'm saying? He come back and said, I killed the dude. I said, the fuck you tell me for? What you tell me for? You making me a conspiracy to something? But the die had been cast, thus leading Charlie to seek sanctuary in Death Valley. I asked if he remembered the day that he was arrested for the final time. Yeah, one of these incompetent fucking assholes got me, put a pistol on me, and put handcuffs on me. And I've been in handcuffs for uh, 18 years. That's the only reality he's got, is me in handcuffs. It was here in this tiny cabinet in the Barker Ranch bathroom that Manson attempted to hide from police during the raid of the ranch. One of the arresting officers saw a string of matted hair sticking out of the cabinet. Hi, said Charlie. Today, the cabinet where Manson lived his last moment of freedom is gone. In essence, it seems that Manson is not serving his life sentence for murder, 
since he was at no time ever accused of murdering anybody, but for his subversive ideas and because of the abstract notion that he is simply too dangerous. In a mockery of justice that was his trial, he was not allowed to defend himself. When he was finally given the right to testify in court, prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi argued that Manson's hypnotic powers might be too persuasive to the jury. Thus they were banned from hearing his testimony on the grounds that they might be convinced of Manson's innocence. During his testimony that was delivered to an empty courtroom, Manson declared, These children that come at you with knives, they are your children. You taught them. I didn't teach them. I just tried to help them stand up. You can send me to the penitentiary. It's not a big thing. I've been there all my life anyway. What about your children? These are just a few. There is many more coming right at you. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. Thank you, that melt in your arms but my green monster don't blame me can't you see when you do the things you do say that you say it or pray that you're praying but don't blame me I can't help it if that doggone moon won't shine. All this stuff that's right. You've been standing on the sunshine. Don't blame me. I never told you what to do. I was stupid enough to believe that I had rights in this country. You know, I believed in what the judge said. In other words, I worked for 20 fucking years to get out of jail. I did everything these assholes told me. I thought that Ding Ding was my daddy, man. I played up underneath that fool and did everything he told me to do, right? Just perfect. Perfect to the letter of the law, all the way down the line. Then when I got outside, I never broke that law. I'm incarcerated because they're afraid. And I'm sitting there watching all you fucking Rube Scoops, you dig? Playing my life all these years. You take me from court, you dig? And the lawyer represents me, and then he got guys that represent him, and then they all represent that, and then these guys represent me, and they all represent that, and they all re they only represent me to start with. It's all in my life that they're standing up with all this big old shit that they're standing up in. It's my life that they're feeding on at the bottom. The king don't have any clothes, man. You dig? We told you that in 69 when Nixon fell down. Now you're trying to drag that same old egg up there and try to put something up that's already gone, man, rather than try to build another one. Manson is crazy, it is said, because he believes that he is Jesus Christ. Behind this cartoon conception is a more complicated cosmology than has been previously understood. And then you see Jesus and you see Christ as being a little God, partner. Because I had the altars of the Druids long before the cross came. And the altars of the Druids will be there long after the cross is gone. Whether the Christians like to accept it or not, he did what I was saying, the cross came by and passed by my window, and I seen it go by, and I said, Ah, oh, Christ was a little God. Ah! Because that was where they hung that fucking last asshole. What do you think about that last asshole? He was, he's still there. And you see him? He's still right there. Nothing's changed. It's right now, down, and then as it's right now, now. You dig? And I'm not going back over there. Fuck them assholes. Manson's use of Christian terminology may have been inspired by a man who once walked a similar path. Francis Penovic was a burglar, con man, and petty criminal who had spent much time in prison before he changed his name to Krishna Venta in 1948 and announced that he was the Christ Everlasting. 
In the 50s, Krishna Venta built his Fountain of the World commune in the Santa Susana Mountains, not far from the Spahn Ranch where Manson and his family would settle over a decade later. Like Manson, Krishna Venta's following consisted mostly of young female disciples. They were given different colors according to their temperament and aptitudes, much like Charlie's rainbow. Krishna Venta was killed in 1958 in a dynamite blast ignited by a jealous husband who disapproved of the guru's sexual teachings. But his legend lingered in the area to inspire Manson to attempt to take over the cult years later. Atop this skull-like rock formation at Fountain of the World, Manson held crucifixion rituals that culminated in family orgies. At one time during his Hollywood period, Manson was hired as technical advisor for a Universal Studios film project concerning the second coming of Christ. When Charlie learned that the producers intended to portray Christ as black, he abandoned the project. You see, now, every time I come down off of this, you don't like me. Then I'm a no good son of a bitch because then I put a piece of steel right there on my leg and I sure not can cut anything with any place I want to cut it. And I live within the sphere of me. I don't push it off on nobody else. You take the most holy man they got, you dig, and treat him as worse as they can. Degradate him, drag him through all kinds of shit, spit on him, cuss him, just do everything and then turn around and go to church and worship him on Sunday and think you're going to get away with it. Don't work that way. And yet, for all of Manson's identification as man's son, the son of man, the archetypal figure of the hanged man or the slain king, he is perhaps more commonly identified with the opposite force in nature. You know, I mean, they, they preach it, but they don't believe it. I believe it. I don't preach it, but I know it. It's a reality. It's a reality. Jesus Christ is a reality. And so is that other guy. The dark allure of Satanism and the mystique of the vampire link Sharon Tate and Susan Atkins in a web of mystery. They seem bound together by destiny, protagonists in a drama decreed by fate. There are parallels in their lives that defy logic. In 1967, Susan Atkins was an aspiring actress making her living as a stripper in San Francisco's North Beach. Strangely enough, she worked under the pseudonym of Sharon King. She was hired by Anton Zandor LeVay, the high priest of the Church of Satan, to play the part of a vampire in a topless witch's review held at a San Francisco nightclub. Atkins had written of this performance. I was the perfect sexy vampire, ready for my casket lying at the center of the stage. I knew I'd never be able to get into that casket for real without getting stoned. I popped the acid tab into my mouth. I had shaken several people when I had risen from the casket and pointed a long, blood-red fingernail at the audience and marked them my next victims. The same year that Susan Atkins made her debut as a vampire, Sharon Tate was cast by her husband-to-be, Roman Polanski, as a vampire's victim in his film, The Dance of the Vampires. In the film, Tate's character is referred to as a sacrifice to Lucifer. Earlier in her career, Sharon Tate had played a witch in the British film The Eye of the Devil, 
or 13. During this film, Tate began a brief period of dabbling with white witchcraft. She was initiated into the coven of Alex Sanders, self-proclaimed king of the witches, by high priestess Maxine Sanders. The ritual was held in Tate's dressing room trailer on the set of the film. If Sharon Tate was fascinated with the more benign aspects of the occult, Susan Atkins held a similar short-lived dalliance with black magic. Here she is seen in the ritual chamber of the Church of Satan with founder LeVay. Perhaps it was inevitable that Sharon Tate and Susan Atkins, both dilettantes in the opposite extremes of occultism, would finally meet in 1969. It is alleged that Susan Atkins licked the blood of Sharon Tate off her fingers that night before leaving something witchy on the wall, reenacting their previous roles as vampire and vampire's victim. At the approximate time of Sharon Tate's murder, 12.30 a.m., the TV guide for August 8, 69, reveals that a film entitled The Vampire's Ghost was broadcast over the airwaves. There are other oblique links between Anton LaVey's Church of Satan and the Manson phenomenon. On the very night of the Tate murders, Anton LaVey performed a rite in the same ritual chamber where Susan Atkins had once posed. This ritual was entitled The Riding Forth, and its purpose, according to LaVey, a strict advocate of law and order who despised the 60s lifestyle, was essentially to cast a curse upon the hippie movement. Part of the invocation read that night, Beware, you psychedelic vermin! Your smug pomposity with its thin disguise of tolerance will serve you no longer. We know your mark and recognize it well. We walk the night as the villains no longer. Our steeds await and their eyes are ablaze with the fires of hell. Unknown to LaVey, while his sorceries were underway in San Francisco, the killings that would bring the 60s to a screeching halt were being carried out in Los Angeles. Two years earlier, LaVey had served as technical advisor on Roman Polanski's satanic epic Rosemary's Baby, in which LaVey appeared in a cameo role as the devil himself. Rosemary's Baby was filmed at the Dakota Hotel in New York City, a reputedly haunted edifice. In 1980, Beatle John Lennon was assassinated outside the lobby of the Dakota. Lennon was the author of the song Helter Skelter. Despite these connections with the Church of Satan, the Manson case has been more often associated with the supposedly satanic cult known as the Process Church of the Final Judgment. The process, seen here in a meeting in London, was formed by ex-Scientologist Robert de Grimston and his wife Mary Ann in 1963. At the center of the Processian philosophy was de Grimston's concept of a reconciliation between Christ and Satan at the end of the world. De Grimston wrote, Christ said, love thine enemy. Christ's enemy was Satan, and Satan's enemy was Christ. Through love, Christ and Satan have destroyed their enmity and come together for the end. Christ to judge, Satan to execute the judgment. Certainly there are some similarities between the process ideology and Manson's. Yet when asked to clarify the rumors of a link, he was evasive. No, that's a bunch of horse shit. No, I don't. Yeah, I know him. I know him spiritually. I know everything. I know everything. You live there on Cole Street. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in the same vibration as all those people. Yeah. In other words, you're with somebody. You know somebody. You know they're there. You're running with them. Oh, you know what I'm saying? You're out in the bushes with them, and you're coyotes with them, or you're in the. You're spiritually allied with them in the scorpions, or you're spiritually allied with them in the, in the awarenesses that she. The image of the process as a war-loving neo-Nazi death cult was largely created by Ed Sanders in his book, The Family, which led to a $1 million lawsuit against him. In fact, a thorough study of the process reveals them to be little more than a sophisticated kind of Jesus freak cult. 
more Christian than satanic, preaching a humanitarian creed far removed from their sinister reputation. Nevertheless, there are some undeniable facts. The family did for a time reside near Process Headquarters, Coal Street, in San Francisco. Manson did contribute an essay to the Process magazine. It is also alleged that two members of the cult visited Manson in L.A. County Jail at the time of his trial. While Manson may be locked in prison, he claims to send his thought out into the world to do his bidding in the form of these emissaries made of string. These fetishistic snakes, spiders, scorpions, and masks have been sent by Manson to friends and enemies alike, along with instructions as to how to bring them to life. Says their creator, I sit in my cell and sing and make little dolls on a string, and I send them out to do little jobs. I give them names, I give them a little personality. Another occult figure linked to the family is filmmaker Kenneth Anger, student of Aleister Crowley and an early member of the Church of Satan. At one time, Bobby Cupid Beausoleil, seen here in Haight-Ashbury, was Anger's protege. Anger dubbed Beausoleil Lucifer and starred him in that role in his ill-fated project, Lucifer Rising. When the two had a falling out, Beausoleil is reputed to have stolen Anger's film and buried it in Death Valley, asking for a ransom. Anger is said to have replied by placing a curse upon his fallen angel. After his incarceration for the murder of Gary Hinman, Beausoleil composed a soundtrack for Anger's second version of Lucifer Rising. Seen here is Anger's stationery, which still features artwork by Beausoleil. Satan means whatever I'm looking at, whatever I want it to mean. It's on my forehead. It's, it, it's, me, on, it's me if I can get up on that highway. If it's, me, it's me trying to save my air, my water, my trees, my wildlife. It's me on that cameraman. It's me right there in his watch. It's me in his brain. It's me right there on his ears. And when he shaves in the morning, I'm sitting right up underneath his razor. You dig? It's everything that human beings are, don't understand. It's all their fears. It's what they're not sure of. You dig what I'm saying? Satan to me would be God. You would be God to me. You dig? I can worship anything as God. Everything is God. The sun is God. The moon is God. Everything is God. Except the stupid fucking people who got that shit stuck up in their fucking heads and they won't get rid of it. In other words, they talk about in the name of the Lord, we're going to say this. In the name of the Lord, we're going to say that. In the name of the Lord, if, if there was such a thing, you see what I'm saying? Would he be the devil? If there was such a thing, would he be the devil? I'm out there on the highway. <laughs> sure, I'm out there on the highway. I'm out there on the highway in Big Dragon, in the underworld. I'm out there in Hawaii. I'm out there in all kinds of different things. Uh, you might say I'm kind of like Satan. I'm in so many different places at once. <laughs> yeah, it would be like Satan. It would be very sharp for one person to do all the things that I'm going to have to do to survive in you and in you and in you and in you too. Manson the Revolutionary has inspired extremists on both sides of the political spectrum. The left-wing group The Weathermen, whose leader Bernadine Dorn proclaimed in 1969, Dig it. First they killed those pigs, then they ate dinner in the same room with them. Then they even shoved a fork in a victim's stomach. The weathermen announced that 1969 was officially the year of the fork. In 1974, an aborted plan to break Manson from prison was concocted by Manson followers in cooperation with the Symbionese Liberation Army. At the opposite polarity, Manson has served as the inspiration for such racist socialist factions as the Ohio-based Universal Order, whose founder, James N. Mason, created this flyer extolling Manson as an independent genius. Well, as, as with all of us, my first uh, awareness of Manson came in uh, 1969 with, with the so-called Tate killings. 
And uh, I was a teenage kid sitting at home watching the news, and the word flashed. A bunch of uh, Hollywood types had been uh, killed out there, presumably by hippie types. And of course, being a National Socialist in the 1960s, I was highly anti-hippie, but I was just as much anti-Hollywood. And so the only thing that flashed across my mind then was good. It couldn't have happened to a sweeter bunch. Mason, a one-time associate of the late American Nazi Party leader George Lincoln Rockwell, spoke of his fervent belief in Manson's cause. But it, it has to come from the people, from the blood, and it, it, it's a fortuitous genetic combination, as with Adolf Hitler. Who could have predicted Adolf Hitler? And who could have predicted Charles Manson? Coming from, uh, what, a 16-year-old runaway, unwed girl in, in Kentucky and West Virginia, no education, and, and look, uh, look at the impact he has today. Leader is a convenient term, and so is family. But, but we have to stay with what can be most readily understood. Manson gave the people around him what they needed most. This is what they accuse Hitler of doing in his, in his speeches, touching every wound in the raw. He can have an audience of 100,000 and reach every member of that audience independently, separately. And, and uh, Manson did the same thing. Manson designed this logo for the universal order, but clearly separates himself from the fray of left-right dichotomy. I wish you'd send James a copy of this and tell him if he had them swords, I just reach and take them swords and I break them and throw them down on his feet. You dig what I'm saying? And I tell him, now stand at attention when I'm talking to you. That's where it comes from. It didn't come from no fucking book. Stand up, Ron, and knock your fucking brains out. You dig what I'm saying? Handcuff the son of a bitch down there and let me I'll show you how I interrogate the motherfucker. You dig what I'm saying? I'll interrogate you. I reach in your brain and pull your fucking soul out and throw it on the floor. I'm tired of this bullshit, you dig? And all these people that run around and play acting like hoo hoo gaga and playing all that shit, they better get, they better get, they better get in line or get off the motherfucker. You dig what I'm saying? Lynette Fromm has written. As for Manson's revolutionary right-wing cause, I believe that if Manson had wings, he'd have at least two of them and a substantial soul self in the center. Indeed, Manson's vision of order in the world surpasses any simple political solution. And Jackson wants to run to be president. Man, <laughs> you better hope somebody wants to be president. You dig what I'm saying? But uh, who in the hell would want to be? Can you, can you conceive of what kind of brain would want to want, want to lead these, these fucking rube scoops out there? And, you know, because there's no communication with them. You dig? If you took a horse whip and beat them, they still wouldn't understand what the hell you're talking about because there's no, there's no intelligence there, man. There's too many people. Oh, man. Yeah. You know. They'll pray for Hitler to come back. They'll wish he hadn't been here. They don't have the intelligence to change. Once you get them, huh? They go, huh, the rest of their life, huh, huh, they'll do that for a paycheck, huh, huh. You tell them, don't do that no more, and they go, huh, huh, there's no communication. You tell them, I tell them, stop doing that, and they'll go, huh, huh. I said, stop it, and they'll go, huh, and you cut the someone's fucking throat and throw blood in their face, and they'll go, huh, huh. You see what I'm saying? In other words, there's just no intelligence, man. So you, don't any, you don't have any hope for mankind, man. Uh, not on that level. Not on that level, I don't. No. That's not mankind. That's not intelligence, you know. It's not even beast. It don't have the intelligence of a zoo, you know. Now, they're all running from Jackson, right? <laughs> they're all making excuses. Well, oh, uh, oh, they don't want to give him this driver's seat, do they, huh? <laughs> and I'm laughing. I'm laughing like crazy, man. Because uh, I think uh, when he goes up there and says, well, now, what have we got here? He's going to find out. It's got a fucking bu bunch of bullshit there, too. Makes no difference what they call you. Y'all call you the Boosky. You're the commander of Mamscam. You know, what does that mean? You still got to live with what you do. You dig? <sighs> well, evil. In order to put this world into order, how much evil do you think would have to be you see what I'm saying? In other words, just to think world peace up underneath these incompetent fucking assholes that run these places, 
You dig what I'm saying? Uh, what kind of man you think would have that in his in his head? Manson has often been compared to Adolf Hitler, and asked whether he feels connected to the Fuhrer, he answers. We all do. Anybody that wants to put order into the world, anybody that's got a brain that wants to put order into the world has got to stumble upon Hitler, because Hitler started putting order into the world. And when he started putting order into the world, it threw him out, it overwhelmed him. It was too big for him, he couldn't do it, you dig? Um, nowadays it's a different computer. It's a different, if it's a different world, it's a different thought. Nowadays, you don't need all that explosive power. You can do it on your computers with your buttons and stuff, with your aids and bays, and with your biscuit berets and biscuit buttons. I just think he was thrown in his time doing his trip for whatever. See, you don't have any other choice. Once you get order in yourself, then you got to reach the order in your, in your own household, in your own family, in your own kin, in your own kind. You got to reach that order. You can't go, I can't go and tell this man something until I can tell me something. If I'm right within me, then I can tell him what's right within what I think. But each man has to be right within what he thinks, Dig. I can't make another man right. The other man got to be right with himself. Manson also expresses a kinship to Rudolf Hess the occultist, ecologist, and folk medicine student who served as Hitler's deputy. Hess died under mysterious circumstances in Berlin's Spandau prison after decades of incarceration as a war criminal. You remember when they had a harmonic conversion? All the people was up on this mountain over here? Hess died that night. I am. I am. Hess died that night. When Hess died that night, that put me longer in prison than anybody in the world. Hess was always longer than me. But when he died, that put me, the only living thing that was standing on that very same thought that you and I are standing on now. You see what I'm saying? In other words, we're still in that same dream. We're still in that same thought. And nothing can take that. You can take my body away and stick it down in that cabinet. It's still there. You dig what I'm saying? You cannot take it. You dig what I'm saying? There's too many people that gave their lives for it. They gave their lives and they're still bleeding there for it. You dig? And the spirit is there. Manson has certainly been an influence on the burgeoning U.S. skinhead movement. And perhaps the skinheads are the true inheritors of the spirit of the shaven-headed girls that performed their sidewalk vigils during Manson's trial. Yeah, there's no order because incompetent assholes like this run your world this is the these are the fucking ding dings that run your world man look at him fat hanging off his fucking jaws he's an incompetent piece of shit you dig he wear black cowboy boots and play off this guy and pay that guy to hold me down you dig what i'm saying and then come back around on the other side and talk about i'm a white guy <laughs> i'm a white brother <laughs> you dig what i'm saying what do, you think about race? what do i think about race everybody look out for themselves i look out for this guy this is my race, comes out of my dickhead, man. My race comes out of me. You know, where I'm running is, uh, you know, I run in the alley, I run in the darkness. If uh, I was sitting up there where I had my fingers on the buttons, it'd be a different game altogether. Charlie has been on the front lines of the ecological war since the 50s, and he calls his vision for reordering the environment and the earth, Atwa, air, trees, water, animals. Pollution, pollution, pollution. It's the only solution for survival on the planet Earth is a revolution against pollution. It's like all, all, the, all the animals are running this way and a lion comes on a picture, they all run that way. All the animals are all divided all up, all the people are out there playing all these games. A bigger fear comes, they all get together and they all run in one direction. The, the peace plan is uh, 
that Schultz and all them guys are playing in the Middle East, it doesn't have any fear in it. It doesn't mean anything. It's a bunch of fucking old assholes talking about old rhetoric. What you know? do you think the meaning of fear is? The fear is you'll do it or die. It's that simple. In other words, the ways of animals, I, I identify with more than I do with the ways of the humans. Humans are, are pretty stupid. Humans won't survive. Humans ain't going to survive. Not the way they're going. You think they're going to destroy themselves? Yeah, definitely. They're going to destroy every fucking thing. They're destroying everything. See, people don't realize how many... If you sit down and you started thinking people, it would take you 10 weeks to think up 200 million people, man. Do you know how many people that is? Now, you run out of food with 200 million people. You run out of oil with 200 million people. You run out of thought with 200 million people. You got a lot of meat there, man. That's a lot of meat to deal with, T. You know, I'm reaching for perfection, just like we all reach for perfection. But my perfection is in the air, the water, the trees, and the wildlife. And it goes beyond my physical. You see what I'm saying? In other words, they can't understand. I've already gave this physical up, man. The physical's hanging down there on the courtroom. You know, if you want to interview me, why don't you go talk to the, to the DA? Maybe he can make up some more lies for you, some more stories for you. And here's another thing that you people talk about. All these peace movement, all these demonstrators, they'll run out and demonstrate for a nuclear power plant and turn, go home and turn electricity on. If you want to demonstrate for a nuclear power plant, don't use electricity. <laughs> Does it make sense? You know what I'm saying? They want to demonstrate for something on one hand and get their faces up in the camera and like, look at me, I'm different you know, or pay me to be somebody, you dig? And then on the other hand, they can't be somebody because they go home and turn the fucking electricity on and use the same fucking pollution. You dig what I'm saying? In other words, you can't protest cutting down trees with paperwork. You can't protest pollution riding around in automobiles, you dig? I told you 40 years ago, get back to the horse, man. What's the best way to change things? I get back to the horse. If you don't get back to the horse, there's gonna be nothing left of you. Now, it's dawning in the minds of many it's dawning in the minds of chemistry. It's dawning in the minds of biology. And I got seven big locks in my brain, you dig? And then I send off to Norway. Sure. Uh, and I send him a thought, and it goes to Norway, and the chemistry, and they're looking in the little things. You dig what I'm saying? And then I'm over here in Australia sitting on a bushman. Uh, I don't need a telephone to, co to communicate with that bushman. You dig ones? That bush man is right inside my soul, man. He's just, he's right inside. I can hear, I can hear everything. I can see through his eyes. You see what I'm saying? It's like I am that bush man. After Manson's imprisonment, Lynette Fromm and Sandra Good continued the fight for Atwa. Good sent this manifesto to the Associated Press in 1975. The International People's Court of Retribution is a wave of assassins. It is made up of several thousand people throughout the world who love the earth, the children, and their own lives. They have been silently watching executives and chairmen of boards and their wives of companies and industries that in any way harm the air, water, earth, and wildlife. They can be assassinated on the golf courses. They move of their own accord. Necessity dictates policy. Exxon, ITT, Standard Oil, Union Oil, Lumber Company Executives, Gulf Oil, must get out of the country or you'll be killed. We want to live, you maggots, you monsters. Get out of the country or you'll be killed. Manson rails against the money mind as one of his principal enemies. 666 is just a dollar bill. That's the body of the money. The body of the people that work for the money. Take that gold on that man's ring. He, he, he works. How long did you work for that? Two or three weeks to get that ring? And when he got that ring, he puts it on his finger and he writes it around. And he doesn't know that he's holding up the very same value that's working his African brother to death. <laughs> and is starving somebody else down on the ground, but he wears it on his finger like it was okay. I take it off and throw it on the dirt. You know, I wouldn't enslave nobody for a piece of gold. That's stupid. And anybody you see wearing gold, you know, they're just, they're enslaving somebody else with it, you know. But it's where their brain is, and you can't get them out of it. 
Much as simplistic historians have dismissed Hitler's Third Reich as the overcompensation of a failed artist, Manson's vision of a holy war has been generally characterized as nothing more than the jealous rage of a spurned musician, a would-be rock star with delusions of grandeur. In fact, against all evidence, it is widely accepted that the overriding motive for the Tate murders was Manson's resentment against Doris Day's record producer son, Terry Melcher. According to this theory, Manson was so enraged that Melcher did not provide him with a record contract, he ordered his slavish minions to murder everyone in the house he believed to be Melcher's. 1050 Chiello Drive. Melcher himself put the lie to this theory in a 1974 Rolling Stone interview where he said that Manson knew Melcher did not live any longer at that address because he had tried to get in touch with him under friendly circumstances at his house in Malibu. This image of Manson, desperate for big bucks and fame at any cost, has also given rise to the lingering rumor that Charlie once went to a casting call for the TV show The Monkees, hoping to be cast as one of the ersatz Beatle imitators. This would have been a difficult audition, however, as Manson was imprisoned in Terminal Island at the time of this casting call. To imagine Manson attempting to fit his music into the prepackaged sterility of popular entertainment is absurd. The way I communicate is uh, in, in music, it's like to know someone, you start in the fingertips, you can, you can know me in my fingers, you can know me in my hands. You can know me in my arms. You know, in other words, I'm something inside that goes beyond words. Words don't, words, blah, 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 you know, they're a bunch of fucking biscuits. That's what they teach you in school. You know, I live from here. But I can't get any music out of this. I can't get any music out of nothing. These motherfuckers cut me off of my music, see? And then they represent off to the little girls. Look at me, little girls. Music is my soul. Music's the way I express. It's my religion. It's my religion. You've also said sex is religion. Yeah, sex is a reflection. Everything's a reflection of this. When you reflect that, you reflect music. I reflect it in music. That's me. But I put my soul into the sound. That's in my music, see? But that's what they won't let me get out. And then every time they keep that music out, then all the kids rise up and they kill a bunch of people. And then they say, well, oh, you're fucked up. Well, why are we fucked up? Who says that you can put your music up over my music? You dig what I'm saying? Who put your voice up over my voice? Who says your God's bigger than my God? You dig what I mean? In other words, it's just a, if you get down in the alley with it, and whose dog's the biggest dog? I'm the biggest dog when I'm out there in the street. I just like to get on down the road and play my music. See, I played my music for... Is you, are you hot in here? I play my music for me. I don't play my music to entertain people. I play my music because I am my music, you know, and I live 24 hours a day in music. Da, da, da. Manson began concentrating on the guitar in 1959 when he was serving time with Alvin Creepy Carpus, the last survivor of Ma Barker's gang. The old con, who had been personally arrested by J. Edgar Hoover, taught the young Manson a few techniques on the steel guitar that were quickly worked into his repertoire. In 1968, Manson and the family met the Beach Boys, seen here at a Halloween get-together. They admired Manson's music enough to record one of his songs, Cease to Exist, although they altered the lyrics to the more palatable Cease to Resist, and retitled the song, Never Learn Not to Love You. The song can be heard on the Beach Boys 2020 album. Because when I fell out of this penitentiary and I was playing my music, you, Neil Diamond, Buffalo Springfield, I'm Beach Boys, all them guys came to me, you dig? And you said, how can you play this kind of music, man? We've never heard this kind of music before. 
you know. He said, wow, this is strange kind of music, you know. And I said, oh. And they copied and stole from me and took it down and put it in whatever they did, you dig? Dennis Wilson, the Beach Boys drummer, was particularly taken with the family and allowed them to inhabit his mansion for some time. Wilson raved in one interview that he had a friend who was a little like the devil, who liked to be called the wizard. Sometimes he frightens me, Wilson admitted. Manson, however, is scornful of the idea that his friends in the music industry were of any help to him at all. Ain't nobody ever tried to help me do nothing, man. Nobody helps you. Everybody wants to ride. <laughs> they talk about help, but there ain't no such thing. You gotta help yourself. Everybody that says they want to help you, you dig what I'm saying? They got, you know, everybody's, you know, we all hold a little, and then where does, who does it all balance off on? Utilizing one of the Beach Boys recording studios, Manson recorded an album of songs on August 8, 1968, exactly a year before the murders transpired. The album was released as Lie after Manson's arrest. He has since recorded other music, which has been smuggled out of prison and distributed to a few devotees. Perhaps the ultimate myth relevant to Manson and music is the fiction created by Vincent Bugliosi, stating that Manson believed the Beatles were sending secret messages to him on their White Album. I'm not of the 60s. I'm not a generation of the 60s. The 60s were little kids to me. The Beatles were little, like punk rock is to you. That's what the Beatles was to me. They were, they, you know, that's not my era. My era was Bing Crosby. I'm 53 years old. I'm not a teeny bopper. In a sense, Charles Manson the man no longer exists. He has been replaced and transformed by the symbol rather than the flesh and blood being. The real Manson now resides in the imagination of the public, voracious for their next vicarious thrill. As for the man himself, he claims not to care how the media portrays him. Fuck the people out there. Well, that don't know you. I don't give a fuck whether they know anybody that don't know themselves don't know me. I don't give a fuck about people. I'm looking out for this guy, you're right not, here. You're not angry how the media has portrayed you as this <laughs> monster. <laughs> what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Media is a rerun. Public opinion is a little girl. It's a toilet paper commercial. It's got nothing to do with reality. Reality's here. Reality's now. As with other villains of our time, Manson has been immortalized in wax in chambers of horrors all over the world from London to Jerusalem. Ever since the trial, the Manson book genre has been a cottage industry in itself. While some information may be gleaned in these texts, one is usually forced to read between the lines of the author's self-service. Whether it be the self-righteous bluster of Bugliosi, or the Christianized crocodile tear confessions of Miss Atkins and her associates, the subject is more obscured than illumined by this ever-growing library. The self-proclaimed counterculture produced many underground comic books dealing with Manson, diverging in tone from the snide approach of R. Crumb to the preachy Legion of Charlies that compared the My Lai Massacre to the Tate murders. It was inevitable that Manson should have become grist for Hollywood's money mill, for the most part, he has been the stuff of low-budget exploitation films, which attempt to turn the case into cheap horror, taking morbid delight in the sexual and violent aspects of the cult. Isn't it funny, you got so many people play-acting you. So many people play-acting you, you never get a chance to play-act yourself. Manson's filmic alter egos have ranged from a vampiric guru in Death Master to a rabid devil worshipper in I Drink Your Blood. Let it be known, sons and daughters, that Satan was an acid head. Drink from his cup. Pledge yourselves. And together we'll all freak out. A 
but strange cinema reality link is this final scene from Sharon Tate's final film, Thirteen Chairs, prophetically featuring a Manson doppelganger. After this scene was filmed in Rome, Tate returned to Los Angeles and her destiny. Compared to the vision of bloodthirsty snuff guru so prevalent in the 70s, Manson is increasingly presented in a lighter vein of recent date, as this scene from a supposed comedy entitled Armed and Dangerous reveals. What are we to make of this subtle shift in perception? If indeed the monster the media created can be reduced to a slightly wacky figure of fun, perhaps there is a change in the zeitgeist brewing. The far-seeing journalist Wayne McGuire predicted in 1970 that someday in the future, Charles Manson will be a major American folk hero. While housewives may still shudder at tabloids such as these, there are indications that Charlie is becoming a less malevolent presence in the oversoul. Manson the commodity can be purchased not only in bookstores and video emporiums, but in clothing stores as well. Indeed, one trendy shop in London was named Helter Skelter. A nightclub in Los Angeles also uses the name. In 1987, the Piedmont Candy Company released a short-lived deck of collector cards called Terrorist Attack, which features Manson in distinguished company. John As Nile, director of the cult favorite Manson's Home Movies, a Super 8 extravaganza that documents the gorier elements of family history, offers an entire spectrum of Charlie memorabilia to an ever-growing market of Manson files under the aegis of his Manson archives. At a recent satanic rally in San Francisco, the film The Other Side of Madness was shown to an audience that cheered through the reenactment of the Tate murders. On the fringes of society, there have been small but serious efforts to rally public support for the cause. A shadowy organization called the Friends of Justice planned a series of concerts to raise legal funds for Manson. At Manson's 1989 parole hearing, a group of black-clad protesters picketed for Manson's release. However, if there is something new in the wind, Manson is indifferent. This whole motherfucking uh, attention thing, I don't need nobody's attention about nothing. I can do what I do by myself. I don't need nobody. I ain't looking for no followers. I'm looking to survive. And survival to me is out there in that desert, running around with them wolves and them coyotes and them bugs and birds and bush bushes and things. I want to get back on the ground with mine, you dig? But now I can't get all these people that are, that are trying to be and do like me. You dig what I'm saying? In other words, like I got all this fucking attention on me. I got 900 million people. You dig what I'm saying? Now how do I get away from them? In the end, Manson is only concerned with the unfathomable parameters of his own world, his recurring fascination with reflection. See, the judgments are, how will I judge anything? I'm judging it from what's inside of me. How will I see anything? I'm seeing it from what's inside of me. The man in the mirror. I go beyond the man in the mirror because I set the mirrors on the ends of your roads, Jake. But I set them with these little nooses. When your children come in to me, I hang them on the ventilators according to what I need to be and what I have to get done to weave my patterns to do whatever I have to do to survive in the places where you know the pictures where we live everybody that thought that they're playing me I think they'll end up <laughs> finding out that they got played by themselves Because we each get the guy in the mirror. Could you look in the camera and tell people they're going to see this? 
Tell them, tell them who you really are. Tell them who I really am? I'm uh, this hand here. With no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, yeah. Yeah. That shoulder there. Yeah, you look like a healthy young man. I like you. Talk to the people out there. You see you well, I can't talk to the people. I, that's well, a, gonna, that's a, just a, in, well, that's that's your reality. You you you're the one that does that. I don't. Well, what, I'm what dealing you, with what you. What do you have to say that you've never been able to say before? You've been through a lot, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's that's why we can probably meet as easy as we do. I feel real comfortable with you, man. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So what what do you have to say that you've never been able to say in this situation before? Uh, I'm going to survive. If you do or not, that's up to you. You dig? But uh, the only thing that keeps me su- from surviving is the people that don't want to survive. So here's what I would say to all the people that have the death wish. Why don't you go ahead and find your own way out? Why come to me with all this dying and all this fear and all this bullshit? I'm not into dying and fear. I'm into music. I play music. I play music. I ride my motorcycle around. And I can play anything, any act. I mean, I've played them all, you know, but which one ain't an act? I don't know. Does it matter? I guess only to how much you're getting paid, you know, or who's paying you. Or if your dollar's going to be worth anything to start with. Or if you got to give half of it to some Jew fucking bastard to doing nothing but laying up and sucking on what somebody else is doing, you dig? In other words, I can't get the maggots out of my brain. Everywhere I look up, man, I got these little fucking bloodsuckers that get in my head. And they want to they wanna just feed from me some more, you know? And I say, good God, man, ain't you fed on me enough? 2,000 years ain't made you fat enough to get off my fucking neck, man, you dig? Who am I? Yeah. I'm anybody I can get away with being. I'll take his clothes and put his boots on and get the hell out of here. And walk on down the road and be a hobo. If I had a good chance... I don't like killing, I don't kill bushes, I don't kill trees, I don't eat animals, I don't like killing, but I'm just like anybody else, I can, when I'm pushed to do that, I can do that just as easy as as eating a piece of steak or or cooking a chicken, it all balances off on Rock Hudson to be the macho until they find out that he's not really that, or uh, to uh, the Marine Sergeant who... uh, can't say what he's doing in the locker room. You know what I mean? I mean, who cares the balance of what the in-betweens are, you dig? In other words, am I a bitch, a homosexual, a punk, or am I a macho, or a boot goop, or a flim dim, uh, or am I all things to all people in all ways? Am I their death if they, if they seek it too closely? Am I their judgments if they find harshness within themselves? Am I their uh, uh, benefactor? If I've got the, uh, in other words, like, what am I? Oh, me? Hell, I don't make nothing happen. I just walk along with what's going on. I mean, make happen. What? Your well, the same thing with you and your world. What, uh, you know, like, you've made me happen. I mean, you know, how can you say I make you happen when you made me happen just as much as I made you happen? I'm only what you put into me. You dig what I'm saying? No, no, no. You put your thought into me. You sent me this, and you did that, and you said so-and-so, and you put such and such. And I said, oh, is this what you see? Man, this must be, you know, wow, you know what I mean? All right. You know what I mean? In other words, if that's what you see, then I'll meet you in that. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Fantastic. If I lived with you for about a month or two then you would have a whole different concept of me. You wouldn't think the same thing of me. Your, your whole opinion of me would change. Not only your opinion of me would change, your opinion of you would change. 
and we would kind of reflect off into each other to where we become a part of. They'll walk up and down and tell you, yeah, this is me, baby, and this is me, real boo, but that ain't them. It's just a carbon copy reflection of, you know. They won't let, they won't let the reality of. You've said that you're a reflection of everything around you. Sure, what else could a child be? That goes into you. You're going to reflect it sooner or later. If I'm going like this, pretty soon you're going to reflect that. All children do. I'm born right now. Anybody that puts their life on the line for me, I've always been right there with them. Because I stay right there all the time. I was born and raised there. I stay there all the time, constantly. I'm so much there, you dig what I'm saying? That Japan came over and said hello. <laughs> and I said hi. You dig? And then anybody with any respect would respect me. But any punk that don't have respect and all that fear and insecurity, you dig? Then they treat me like the fucking punk that they are. In other words, they give me all their insecurity. I can't see no mistakes. I think the infinite wisdom of all things are perfect. Even these guys, even though I don't agree with them, you dig? And I, I conflict with them, and I argue with them, and I struggle for the same thing they struggle for, perfection. Don't place uh, no emphasis on history because uh, they all lie. The truth is that your history books are full of bullshit. Most of your books are full of bullshit. You know that, being a writer yourself. How do you think people are going to remember you? I don't think people, there's going to be anybody to remember anything. You know, they're destroying everything. Mm -hmm. They'll destroy it all the way back down to the coyotes and the wolves and the scorpions and the bugs and the snakes. And they'll probably see a few of us fake phony son of a bitch sitting over and looking at the thing saying, yeah, yeah, that's an old rerun in Mars somewhere. I'm just checking that dude out, man. Cameramen have a way of hiding. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, are you Irish? Uh, Irish English, yeah. Yeah, that's what I figured. Ready complexion, huh? No, what always happens every time I get out of jail, I, I have a kid. And then the broad ends up snitching on me or getting me locked up. And then she takes the kid on down the road. And she raises him up to be like her. And then I see him when he gets to be about 30 or 40 years old. He's a little fat fucker. He thinks just like his mother. You did? So I see a bunch of little fat fuckers that think just like their mother. And I look at him and I see, yeah. Do you know if any of your children have followed in your footsteps? They're all my children. And anybody ever seen me is following in my footsteps. How else could they do anything else? Should I explain that? It's a brand new step, never been done. It's history. Every step I take now is history. And I'm carrying 900 million people in my mind. You see the Pope? <laughs> He's a cigarette butt on the floor. Now open, open, open up your mind into that. See all the Orientals and the dragons? All the tongs? See all the feathers? See the swastika spinning? You see it coming alive? In our minds as a youth, in our minds as a youth, you see that spirit coming back? You see it coming back? You dig what I'm saying? In other words, it's coming back in the spirit of the youth. It's coming back from the battlefields. It's coming back. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. And the peace on earth goes beyond that line. And I put that line on the blind man's pole. Then I run that down with some other soul. And then I cut that on back with another track and come back and say, Choo, choo, I know my mind. And I trust the very same person that you do. And the very same person that you do. <laughs> I trust the only person left to trust me.
Manson will always stand as a challenge to all preconceived notions, playing the role of shaman to a society out of order with nature, out of harmony with its own bestial heritage. As the world sinks further into the long slide of self-destruction, Manson's legacy will endure. If he is mad, his is the madness of a visionary, a prophet without honor. Lynette Fromm has captured the Manson enigma best when she said, Everyone has wanted to make him small, yet a monster, stupid, with hypnotic powers, a fascist and a commie, a prejudiced nigger lover, a macho punk, both Christ and the devil. Or, on the opposite side, of everything. Yes, Wait a minute, I'll get it.